Okay, it's streaming live. Oh, we're live. Hey, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Freedom Exchange special Wednesday edition. Yes, we're switching it up on you. Yeah, little. it's actually because it's summertime. Yes, so we have to go with the flow this summer. Yeah. So our people can be available. Someone just crashed. I think my but daughter's just okay. crashed downstairs. Um, so we're just doing a special Wednesday because we got busy and we don't want too much time to go by without introducing awesome people to you guys and letting everybody meet um, and get to know stories. And um, I still go back today. I use this term at work that there's always more to the story. Always, always, always. more. And the thing is never mm -hmm. the whole story. The, the look, the person, the feel like it's never the whole story. And, and it never ends. I mean, the story is not, the story has an end no matter where we are. So it's always continuing. And that's the exciting part. Yeah. There's always more. Yes. So, so we have a really cool thing today. Besides, thank you for matching with me. Sometimes I know, we never we just, know what we're going to wear, but we just showed up from a whole day of work. And here we, we are. Yeah, we're good. Does he just our guest match? He'll 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 blend. He does. He'll blend. Yeah. Right. He has the same tank thing happening. So we have something new today. Yeah. Something cool. Besides doing a Wednesday interview, we have we have a local Oregonian. Yes. Yes. yes we love all of our friends all over the country. Um, but this time we get to have someone with us in person. So yes. that's exciting. We've had Texas, Alabama, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, New Jersey, Virginia. Did you see Texas? Yeah, I think it said that. Um, Is that it? No, I know we're forgetting. Anyway, we've had a lot of good places, but today, since I'm an Oregon girl, you're becoming an Oregon girl. I am. Are you from am Oregon? I? Might as well be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's we Cali, just, Oregon, okay. like me. We should so just let done. him come join yeah. us. So um, without any further ado, we will welcome William. And I'll get up and we're just going to get all snuggly in here today because we're kind of doing this different. So come on. I'll switch you. In the meantime, I just want to say a little bit about what the Freedom Exchange is, if this is your first time here. The Freedom Exchange was founded out of the opportunity to be able to talk to people who have long sentences in prison, people that have helped other people get out of long sentences. And it's an opportunity for us to share our heart, to share stories, to share what happened, to share the humanity of all of us. And, you know, the thing, and it's, there's so many quotes and so many things to say about our, our darkest day is not the thing that defines the rest of our life. It's just a moment. And sometimes people have big, profound, crazy moments. And sometimes we don't, and that doesn't make you a good or bad person. Although one time I did say to Will, I said, you weren't a bad person. And what'd you say? Yes, sir. He said I was. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Mm. So thanks, Will. I know, right? I, I didn't agree with we that. We could all on different days <laughs> and at different times, we all might agree with that. Like, yes, I am. Like we all might say that at different times, but the truth is we're not. We're human and we have things that have happened to us over the years and when, in our childhood. And sometimes we make decisions we maybe shouldn't make that aren't the best for us. He may not agree with us, but that's cool. And, and I, I like to hear about bad that. in my house. He said he no, was. 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 Oh, was. Oh, we're going to get to the was. Good. So you have a different perspective. Let's get over a little bit so we can see him. Okay. So are we ready to, yeah. to do this? This is William. This is William Miskell. Can I, do you want me to start how I met William? Sure. Okay. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So I work for Reclaiming Lives Recovery Cafe during the daytime where we um, help people either get out of prison and um, get acclimated or people that are in recovery or want to be. And so we were helping someone that had got out of prison. His name was also Will. And he started drawing for us and just doing amazing. And he said, I have a friend that's coming, that's out, but he does, he's afraid to come in. He doesn't want to come upstairs. We're like, have him come upstairs. And so anyway, we met William and this is William. And so we, um, we love him and, and he hasn't left us ever since. And he's always available. You're always available anytime we need um, somebody with authority um, to 
It's true. You, you oh, do yeah. have authority to pour into young people and not so young people that are making really bad decisions and to sit in a room where William is on one side and someone else is on the other side and they are and he's just speaking into them and it's really profound. And so that's where I think, wow, this is this is the specialness of meeting people. And so that's why we wanted to do it in person to have William here. So thanks for being mm -hmm. here. Um, and then I was thinking about the authority thing, which we'll get into your story a little bit about um, you. You've had a lot of authority in your life. Maybe it wasn't used for good all the time, but you have had authority. Yeah. Um, and I also before we start just for funness, like what were you doing before you got to, got here today? Working. I was in a big fire truck. Doing what? <laughs> Is that where you wanted? Well, I'm making three hundred dollars a day. Oh well, that's hey. good. <laughs> um, was it a wildfire situation? Because we're in Oregon and we live yeah. by wildfires, and Indeed. we are on evacuation notices all the time, and that's what we do in Oregon. So how'd you get no, on the, the fire ranches. truck? The ranch. Ranches. What ranches need water because the water is like going away going away because it's the middle of summer and all of everything dries up. Yeah. yeah. So I was doing this. Cool. Okay. And I'm like, burnt. a little sweaty. Oh, you, that's cool. You did get some today. I did. It, nice. Jumping in and out. Oh, yeah. Then the water, then the heat, then yeah. burn. But here you are. I have air conditioning. But here we are. <laughs> and I'm and still we're free. free. And we're totally free to I go know. do that stuff. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Okay. So I talked to you. Was it yesterday or the day before? Both. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so Willie and I have been important. talking, and I thought it would be really powerful um William was given a life sentence and I because I have not been in prison and I have not gone through sentencing and um trying to see if there's any way that I could get out of my sentence I've never been through that so each time I meet somebody and they say I had a life sentence and we've had a few of them on the show and they're out it blows my mind I can't understand it so William was, I read his, the letter he wrote, um, his clemency letter, which to the governor, to the governor asking for him to, you know, be heard and his story to be heard. And his letter was so powerful to me. And I, I think the first thing was like, did you write that like all by yourself? And his answer was, it came from my heart. So I think it's powerful to have um, time for story time. Yeah. <laughs> have William read his clemency letter, because this isn't just his story and him sharing what happened to him. This is like, literally what you wrote to the governor and here you are sitting with us as you're sitting in a cell with life on under your release date with no release. this with no release date yeah. to say what what profound words am i going to say to get them to change their minds and which well, never happens and then we're going to go he's gonna before read i read it, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't the what profound words it was actually what truly it was true Mm. Mm. profound so, change profound yes yeah. yeah that's huge so this is going to take a little bit of time for him to read but i want everyone listening just to grasp the concept of he's in a cell he has life without a release date and he's trying to get his life back get his freedom and this is what he wrote and he's sitting here with us so. and, and you went in prison at what age 28 26 28 and you were in there for how long 18 years 18 years and you wrote this letter on august, august. 6 and last got, year of 2020 and you got out november yeah august. november 25th i have such yeah chills it's cool it's, it's a so cool, cool. Story. so um it's double-sided so have at it <sighs> okay we'll put the microphone here so we can hear you good okay i won't touch anything <laughs> It's going to crash everything. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> and we have water here. My name is William Ray Miskell. I'm an adult in custody at Two Rivers Correction Institute in Umatilla, Oregon. I am serving a sentence of 25 years to life with the possibility of parole after 25 for the crime of murder. I am seeking a governor's commutation of sentence. I am asking for commutation because inside, I am not the same young man who committed the crime 17 years ago. I do take full responsibility for my crime and I only blame myself for my terrible decisions leading up to my incarceration. The important question to consider 
regarding my transformation is what has changed in my life since 2003 to the present day. It's kind of emotional, huh? Yes. Yeah, it is. That will impact the ability to live a successful life outside of this prison. To answer that question, I would like to review my life before prison and my progression since incarceration. I'm the youngest of my mother's two children. My father was absent from the home and I never knew him. I met him once when I was 23 and he told me I was just a mistake. I wanted nothing to, he wanted nothing to do with me from the time of my earliest memories my mother was a drug addicted prostitute and alcoholic who brought physically abusive men to our home whom sexually and violently abused my sister and me. I have scars today from cigarette burns and men that were brought into our home. Most of my mother's clients terrorized all of us with violent behavior and chaos. My sister, Samantha Lynn, I will not read her last name, continually ran away and escaped the sexual abuse and molestation. No member of my family was left untouched emotionally and physically because of the toxic environment and lifestyle of my mother lived and to which we were exposed. I began a downward slide in the third grade. I began skipping school, stealing and getting into fights. I think it was mental diversion from the chaos and molestation happening in my home and maybe the way, or maybe a way to cry out for help. I, was, <laughs> I, fell, I fell behind in school and it was thought that I had a learning disability. I was put in special education classes, but look back, I look back now and realized I was just struggling because of the violence and the chaotic life my mother was living and imposing on us. There was no, there was no security in my life. I was just a confused child feeling scared and unsure about the events I didn't understand. I only got worse with time. Oh. You can skip whatever yeah. you skip. Nah, let him know. It's okay. Yeah, you can. I had just turned 12 and I had already started hanging around gang members and partying. One day I was outside of our trailer and my mom was finishing up with a client and I was waiting for her next, and she was waiting for her next client to arrive. When a van pulled up, I had seen the driver before and knew him, his name was Jose. I could tell he was high on drugs and alcohol. He started asking me questions like, do you like beer? Uh, do you want to, or do you want to, do you want some beer? I told him my mom was in the trailer and that she would be done soon. That's when Jose punched me in the face and grabbed me and put me in the van. My hands were tied to something. My shorts were ripped off and he began to rape me. When Jose was done, tossed me in the apple orchard and drove away. A short time after that, I committed burglary with my gang friends and stole guns because I wanted to protect myself. Well, I got caught, ended up doing a chunk of juvenile time. I, I did about three years in that. And in that time, I joined a hard I just say that. I, I didn't write it that way. I joined a gang. Oh. <laughs> I didn't edit it. <laughs> I was jumped into a Mexican gang. I'll leave that out. Say what you want to say. Yeah, I'll leave that out. Um, they looked after me and made me feel protected and loved. They provided a type of security that I had always lacked. And in that sense, they became my family. At the age of 16, my sister permanently ran away and lived with her grandma. She still struggles with the <laughs> interpersonal relationships and alcohol abuse. She now lives in Medford and lives a somewhat normal life. She works and provides for her family. She does not keep in contact with me because 
she says that <laughs> she doesn't want to open old wounds. So it is easier for me to stay away for her sake. I never finished school and dropped out of my senior year. I couldn't keep a job and never even thought about getting my driver's license. I began using drugs, drinking on a regular basis. Today I can see I was a person with no dreams or goals. It's actually clear. And that is, is why I was given the nickname Dreamer. I had no hope. I thought that my life would never change. I understand my mother was suffering her own hell. And she tried to provide the best she could for us under her circumstances. But my mother, Cindy Lumello, continue, continued to lose the, the battle with drugs and alcohol. And she tragically committed suicide in 2000, traumatizing our family even further. I was 23 at the time. Both my sister and I were severely affected by her suicide. My drinking got worse. Her suicide pushed me heavier into drugs. And my best friend got shot and died in my arms. I was just right after. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I gave up living a normal life completely. I cared little for my own life and for the life of others. So just so you know, that's where the bad guy came in. Came in. There was no good guy in there at that time. Mm, I beg to differ, oh, but, but go ahead. You weren't feeling. We like can it. agree to disagree, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> Seriously, it was a state of mind that enabled me to take that. Yeah, enabled me to take another person's life. In 2003, two friends and I planned a robbery from a man we knew was trading drugs to adolescent girls and boys for sexual favors. This knowledge still did not justify my actions. And I'm not going to say his name. Yeah. Uh, the robbery went bad, and I, well, he lost his life. Mm -hmm. On November, November 28, 2003, I was arrested. And actually, that's crazy. The 25th, I got out, the 28th, yeah. they were like days apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whoa, I didn't even realize that. Mm -hmm. I was arrested at a Motel 6, booked in the county jail for multiple counts. I was arrested along with my two co-defendants and, well, they were, I'm not gonna say that. My arrest was almost a relief. My life for the most part was in the hands of others. I had no responsibilities for my future, jobs or relationships any longer. All of that because became irrelevant when I was placed in the back seat of that car. But I felt dead inside. Nothing had changed eternally for me by my arrest. The tragic end I had predicted for myself had finally came. I, I, arrived, I, arrived, I, arrived, I arrived in prison and started my sentence. During the first few years of my incarceration, I was <laughs> in an altercation with my co-defendant. I tried to hurt him because I believe <laughs> He had to make, I had to make a name for myself as a dangerous guy. Actually, the way I wrote that, as a dangerous guy. Huh. Yeah, interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Ended up with some insight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. I'm loving that we chose to do this. This is so good. Uh, good. Is this okay? Are you okay with this? I mean, well, it, it's making me sweat more, but it's okay. <laughs> Want me to eat something? No, I'm okay. It's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's interesting after life. months have passed, a few months, and getting out and pro where you are now and what you wrote. And so I appreciate it. Thank you. Considering the length of my sentence, mm -hmm. I just didn't care because I thought I was going to die in prison. I became, oh, here comes that big word. I became a shock caller, mm -hmm. the head of the gang in the prison during my first eight or nine years. I was in and out of DSU disciplinary segregation and IMU multiple times, intense management unit. One day, an, an ex friend of mine told me to get out of the gang life and stop living like an animal. He told me, William, 
you're too kind hearted and too good of a man with a good head on your shoulders. So walk away and find yourself. I realized I had so much more to give than just to waste my life on others that knew, never truly cared. I walked away and turned my back on the gang life. That was the first change I made. I woke up and felt alive and hopeful for the first time. I asked to talk to the captain, captain and let him know that I wanted to, wanted help getting out of the gang life. I wanted to stop living life with regrets and what ifs and letting a cause or letting it cause a misconception on life. I made the decision to start writing my life, or ridding my life of negative negativity and start living a free man, even while living by the rules in place, the Department of Corrections. Today, if given the chance, I would make a positive contribution to society and live by the laws of our country. The second change inside of me was that I wanted to help teach and be a mentor to others and wanted that wanted to change their lives. I began this goal. I studied and became a GD tutor. I also became a mentor for substance abuse classes, also an anger management class. How many times? Yeah, ask him how many times he did anger management. I've, how many times did you do anger management? 73. <laughs> I facilitated the classes and <laughs> hand out the test is in homework and received the yes, textbooks. I, I read. Were you that angry? I was. So hard for me to see that. I received college credit for those. It's not funny. It's not funny. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Uh, I received college credit for those accredited classes. I, I, did I even spell that right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, wow. good job. Spelling me, good job. <laughs> Not me. Good. I want to be able to share with others how it feels to accomplish, accomplish life-changing goals. To feel free and satisfied, now I have goals and visions for my life that extended beyond the walls and boundaries of my incarceration. Mm -hmm. These goals and visions enabled me to realize the essence of my own being and to discover the meaning of my individual life and to know the real me. I desire to help troubled teens and young adults by letting them know that a life of crime and drugs and alcohol and incarceration is not a, a life worth pursuing. I want to encourage them to put their better foot forward and help them learn to live good, productive life in society. I want to help break the cycle of pain and imprisonment. The third and most important change of all that I had taken place in my life is by accepting the creator, Native American religion, into my life. I began walking the red road. Since that time, I have slowly overcome the hurt and problems that had brought me to prison. The weight, shame, the guilt I felt due to my crime was unbearable. When the creator forgave me for my past, lifted the weight off my shoulders. While I wish I could say the guilt completely gone, my crime still bothers me today and will for the rest of my life. While I trust and believe the creator has taken away my sins, I still wish I had never committed the crime. I, as a result of my crime or change within, I realized I had to take full responsibility for the things that I had done, plus the pain and suffering I have caused for my victim's family. The shame supersedes all other emotions, but no matter how remorseful I am, it doesn't change the one thing, the one and only thing that matters. I took the life of another person. The cycle of regret and loss truly never leaves. I still suffer night terrors and wake up crying in the middle of the night because I truly did not mean to kill my victim. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing that I have changed in my life is that 
I have furthered my education as best as I could with the income I earned in prison. I have taken college and other classes that can or that have been certified in HVAC installation and repair and residential and commercial situations. I have also become a journey journeyman electrician. That was a long one. It took like two years. <laughs> I'm taking a substance abuse class, a substance abuse class that I have paid for by saving the DOC from the DOC job. I have always seen myself as lacking academic ability, but I realize now I can excel when I apply myself. <sighs> you almost yeah. This is a lot. It's good. It's a lot. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's a lot of good. It's a, my head's just going crazy with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I know how it feels to accomplish something worthwhile. Yes. And I want other people that have had similar past to feel the same satisfaction that I feel from the change I have made in my life. Even, I lost my life. Even with the, I, oh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> Even with the restrictions of prison, I have been able to do something positive with my life, something with genuine purpose and meaning. Despite my past mistakes, I am able to help people struggling through life to find forgiveness, hope, education, and confidence. This is what I do now and what I would continue to do if ever I was released from prison. And he is doing now. I am fully co confident that I could live a productive life outside these prisons, prison and contri contribute to society in a meaningful, meaningful way. Yeah. I want to truly pay my debt to society in the way that makes a difference. I, live, I, have, I have lived, <laughs> I have lived most of my adult life yeah. in prison. So when I committed my crime, I was young. I was a young man struggling and trying to survive in a cruel, uncertain, in an incredibly dangerous world. I was young and had dropped out of school and could barely hold a job. I am now, I'm not saying my age because I don't want to be too old. <laughs> We're older than you, it's okay. I know. It's okay, you know how oh, to say it. <laughs> well, I'm 40 something yeah. now. 40 44? Something. 44? Yeah. And have spent many years trying to make the most of every change given to me. I have suffered and survived cancer twice while incarcerated. I have dealt with my internal problems, found spiritual bedrock in the creator, received many educational certifications, excelled at my current job, and my family situation has improved. If released today, I would be going to a stable living environment that would only help me succeed in the modern model citizen. I am not asking you to, to be easy on crime. I am asking you to give me the opportunity to show people everywhere that prison can be a place of redemption and rehabilitation. Mm. We'll ask you <laughs> we don't really we'll ask you Instead that. of just punishment, <laughs> I am asking you to help others who find themselves struggling through life, just as I was when I was younger, so they can realize that there is help and hope for them. And that there are tragic consequences for not seeking the help they desperately need. I was young adult who made a horrible choice. Now I am a man who has made the best of the situation by using every opportunity available to me so I can su successfully return to society. Every man is worth more than his worth today. Every man in prison today is there for his weakest moment. Yep. His gravest mistake in his lesser self a moment of falling or failing or misguided path that he chooses to follow. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. That's where you, why What's you that? asked me about. Yeah. What's that from a movie? Dead 
Dead Man um, Walking. Dead Man Walking. Right. Sister, it was a Sister Helen. It was, yeah. 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 It, it, I did ask you about that. Yeah. I remember seeing it and then reading it, but didn't process mm -hmm. it. But then when I seen it again and wrote it, I was like, that's actually yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that I am always going to be judged for my past, but along with the, with that failing, I am also a down to earth, fun loving and kind hearted person. I generally care about others. It's true. I just want to be able to show them that there is more than life than being in prison. I have broken their hearts. I see why I, I, I cut that out. Mm -hmm. I have broken their hearts enough. I'm talking about my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. I have broken their hearts enough not to be there as, as a father or a friend. My son tried. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going to skip that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, uh, I don't want to even. Yeah. I don't want to see my son follow the, him my same steps as my nephew did and because both my nephew and my other son are in prison. I know. I know. Uh, this did and just as I did to act out because of not being able to have help or someone by his side that understands what he is going through. I'm asking for a chance to be a father and have a normal life alongside my loved ones. Regardless of my conduct in prison, no matter the amount of rewards or certificates I receive or how many good deeds I perform, I cannot make up for the pain I have caused to my victim's family. Yet I ask for the commutation of sentence with the, with the desire to pay my debt to society in a real and meaningful way. I asked with the desire to show that a person, especially a troubled teen or young adult can learn from their mistakes and grow into a moral, responsible and positive contributor to society. I would also like to ask that while conducting your investigation, I encourage you to con contact the contact the officers in, in the prison and Chaplain Odney. Sincerely, William Ray Miskell. Still got the sit number on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like clapping, I don't know why. It was so well written. Yeah. So much. So much, and I think that when you're writing that letter, I'm assuming- Scoot over a little bit so we can see it. I'm assuming you don't want, you don't want to miss a thing if it's the thing that will shift somebody's mind about your release, right? Like you probably just tried to think of everything that possibly you could did. influence you. I felt like you did. Well, I tried to get like how you guys read the letter, so you guys know me more. Yeah. I wanted the governor to read it and see where I came from and to where I could end up. Mm -hmm. Not to where I'm ending up, mm -hmm. but where I could end up. The possibility. Right. Yeah. So I didn't want her to make a decision on just because of my crime or that I've changed. I wanted to, wanted to try to get her to feel that the change inside, mm -hmm. even though I was in prison, I wanted her to feel, okay, he's already changed inside. So he can only get better outside. So. Um, the question I like to ask people a lot is that that pushback question where people will say, well, you you did the thing. And so you deserve to be the sentence you got. That's the rule. That's the law. That's the sentence you got. So now you need to do the sentence. There's not some, there's a lot of people that don't have room to see the person and to understand the full story and to give somebody the grace to change and to do better and to be better. So what, how do you come, what do you do when you get that pushback? Well, I mean, you have to accept it because you can't change other people's minds. You're only responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. So the steps that I take forward, 
I'm not going to be doing it for other people. I'm doing it for myself. So no matter who's around, it's not gonna affect how they think towards me because my best foot is always gonna be forward. Mm -hmm. What do you have to, what do you, what would you say if somebody had open ears to? What would I say? I'm trying to think of the question, how I want to say it. Want to help me? Yeah, what are you trying to say? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure. There's a lot, so I, I don't know what direction. I always come back to my heart for the freedom exchange is that we are not the, the worst day of our life and the worst decision we've made. And I don't, I want to shake people that don't see that. And I know we can't change other people's perspective. And if they want to dig their heels in and say they're, they're bad, they should go to prison. But I've not made great choices. And if ever what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're my really good friend. You know all about you. Well, yeah. But I just, I, I just have this that. heart for let's give people a chance to do better and be better. There, sure, there's people that aren't ready to do better and be better, and I'll just let you do your thing until you decide that's what you want. But for those that have decided, made actions that have shown that there's change and how do we get through to people? How do we, how do we share? Like, there's more to the story. You just didn't wake up one day and decide to do what you did. There's so much to it. I mean, so inarticulate right now. Do you all know what I'm trying I, to Okay, say? I have a theory. Can I share okay. my theory a little bit? Sure. Um, just be, because I've been on both sides. So I was the person that would be judgmental. It's like, what? You know, you were in prison or you murdered somebody or fill in the blank. I was judgmental because I was detached from myself. I was not willing to share who I was. I didn't even really look to see who I was. All I was a people pleaser and I would um, just be the, the mass, be the person that I needed to be growing up. And so to fall and to experience humility and to go to prison, you know, you have a different viewpoint you have your own and then you're so it seems like those that really are the most um, generous in regard to their non judgment are the people that have been through stuff. Right? Well, I mean, also, what do you think? also where it comes back to kind of like when other people don't realize what the whole story, not even the whole story, but you could be here. These come out of your mouth too. What? <laughs> so <shit>. Sitting <laughs> in a room full of people. How do you truly know that the person next to you? Yeah, you never do. You don't. You don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. But people think they do. Right. Because we, we put on a lot of effort to look a certain way. And this has happened to me just recently. Oh, yeah. Remember? Just, Tell them that just, story. Yeah, just this is, again, just with my new boss. I told him my story. I did prison time. And he goes, you did 18 years? And I was like, yeah. He goes, you're not weirded and you're not doing stuff and you did 18 years are you sure i was like yeah i was <laughs> did 18 years yeah and he goes well you don't seem like you've ever been to prison you seem like you're too much of a nice guy yeah and i was like <laughs> <laughs> but see that's why it's so important for us to tell to share our own truth because if you didn't tell your story and if i didn't tell mine because i wasn't going to tell anyone when i got out I mean, I never understood what the purpose would be. So I think that if we all, whether it's prison or not, we share, hey, this this is what I did, or this is what I experienced, or this is where I fell, then we're all human. You know what I mean? But if everyone is quiet, like, I'm sorry, but people look a lot of church things, you know, you look, have a cute dress and some good lipstick and you sit there like this and you don't share, then we just think, oh my God, I'm a bad person, you know, or okay, whatever. You, start to compare. you compare. We're really everybody, you never know. Like the one dude who was going to get at you and you're like, you're lucky that I'm who I am today. He didn't know who he was dealing with. Right. Well, it's he just didn't. like the, the day down at the cafe when I brought my actual sentencing papers. Yeah. I brought them so people could see and people, yeah, yo, you did whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But when they read that paper, you could see that they're like real. Oh yeah. Oh, like really it's <laughs> real. Yes. Yeah. Well, because it's so easy to say the words 18 years, you know, but when you, I like, I make, I try to make people like quiet, like, wait, let's stop and honor 
what 18 years would be. People are having a cow about being in a pandemic for a year and a half, right? I mean, it's, uh, I, when I hear those stories, I just smile because they're saying the new dreams that are coming out that people are having because of the pandemic. I'm on my way to work. I'm thinking all sorts of things, but I don't say, but I just smile going, what about these people? Like a young boy like you who went through all the tragedy and it's like, let's think about that. But I think it may be too horrific for people to understand that prisons are filled filled with those stories they are. wouldn't you say yes the, and, and people don't realize even yeah. though that people are in prison they're not bad people wait i tried to tell you that <laughs> but they have bad moments bad moments yes, yes. but and they hurt truly they hurt people yes it truly need there was a long period that there was no good i'm serious well, let's talk about the leadership qualities you had in prison. I don't yeah. have any. Were you not the guy? Yeah, shot caller. Okay, I was. so I asked you which prison you were in, and you said all of them. I so, were you for our audience, people that are like me that don't know this world as well? Why were you? Tell, explain that. What you said to me. What do you mean? Why you were in the different prisons and how it would move you around, and why they thought they were moving you around, but what it actually was doing. Well, they, they thought because they didn't want me to grow roots. So I went from, yeah. from OSP to TRCI to Snake River to EO back to OSP. Back all in Oregon. Yeah, and all in Oregon. And well, they sent me to New Jersey one time. Just for kids. Well, just, just because they thought that they could separate me mm -hmm. from everybody, but they didn't realize that they were actually growing, growing the roots. The, Maggie, reputa the reputation. Oh, the rep reputation. Oh, that's brutal. And, you know, they didn't really, like I've said in our podcast, you know, they never really respected me, but they feared me. Mm -hmm. So I was really. What's that like being feared? Well, I mean, it's not a comfortable feeling. But Is it a safe feeling, a protected feeling? Well, yeah, because then I know I didn't have to go to extremes to make or were you a target no i was never a target i was the so did you feel like puller. you had to keep doing the things that were putting you in that place to keep yourself safe yes okay so then that's a great transition one day you decided you didn't want to be in that role anymore so then talk about that change well when you have so many people that are dependent upon you and your decision, and if you make that wrong decision, then there's other people going to get in trouble. And then there's other cars. I say cars, other races. Mm. So one other decision. Races, what do you mean? Well, because one know. decision that you make can end up causing a race war. Oh. You, you don't know whatever could happen. Do you feel a lot of pressure all the time? Oh, God. I was like a walking stiff board at times. Talk about your time in solitary. Reading. That's all I did was How read. long? Like how many? Oh, my first eight years. Okay, let's stop for what a What does that look like? Wait a minute. What is eight years in solitary confinement? Is that the word? Lock yourself in your bathroom for eight years. Did you get out at all? Maybe about 30 minutes a day. How, how does someone, and you how, talked about rehabilitation. How does that create re rehabilitation in somebody and not? It doesn't, come on. Strong-minded. So all that, all the people when they say, oh, I go, that was my phone, sorry. <laughs> when they're just thinking, you have to be strong-willed and strong-minded, read, product, work out, do whatever you can, keep your mind away from those four little squares. The, or when I say square, the, the walls. Yeah, eight years though. Eight I years. mean, come on. My, fir my first, eight years. my first trip there I did, it was two and a half years. They were releasing me. And before I even got out the door, I got into another fight. I went right back, six months in the hole, right back to IMU. IMU is? Intense management unit. Is that part of your anger management class? No, it's, it's so when where, you say you got in a fight, sorry, what did that look like? Can you tell me? 
Like what did it look like? Like a what big happened? dude throwing a little dude around. <laughs> <laughs> were you the big dude? I was the big dude. And why? And why did he fight you? Uh, did he know who you were? It, well, Stupid. no, it was just because it was it was a a disrespect the way he looked at me, mm. and I was already I was like, ah, what the hell. So, so there's this huge contrast happening. Yes. There's this eight years you're talking about, which I didn't know you then. And now this person that's sitting here, what, where was the... Was it because you had to be on the whole time and you were angry? I didn't like the way I felt yeah. being part of the game. Mm -hmm. Because that truly was not who I was. It's going back to the bad guy. Yeah. But... In my heart, it was just not me. Yeah. I like the incident I told you about, I was sitting there uh, at the chow hall and that guy gets his throat cut yeah. and I just kept eating. It because didn't bother why? me. Because what were you thinking? Because it didn't bother me. It's not my business. Mm -hmm. William's popular. <laughs> wow. So someone got their throat cut and you just kept eating? Let's tell them. Well, that's. You answered it. <laughs> Who is it? It's my son. Oh, his son is calling him from prison right now. Get it? Answer it. You can go off and go down there and we'll talk. Talk to your son. Unless you just want to say. Do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. Go walk down the hallway. That's crazy. That's crazy. Excuse me, sorry guys. <laughs> This is raw and real and uncut. Yeah. This is how it goes. We want him to talk to his son right now. And he, when he calls, he calls. Yeah. So um, this is good. Yeah. You know, there's so many thoughts. And, you know, women's prison is so different than men's prison. What I realize in men's you prison too? is um, there's, uh, there's just so, there's so much. And, you know, I, I've known William now for a few months and I know him a hundred percent. Like I watch his actions. It's mm -hmm. not what I know, what mm -hmm. I hear. And he's always going to like, you can call him at three in the morning. If someone's like, I, I'm going to hurt myself and he will drop what he's doing. He will come. He will, he will do whatever. He helped someone with suicide just two days ago. Well, and yesterday, or two days ago when I was talking to him, oh, they went they went out to look for someone they were trying to get back into rehab. And when they, they were, said they were gonna kill themselves. Oh yes, okay. And then we tell you the whole so they went, you guys I don't know you were with yeah, them, but they went went and looked for him and, and then he gave him all the money from his wallet, which is a whole thing, like, like is that the right thing to do? Wrong. It's not my place to judge that, but his heart was generous, his heart wanted to help, and then he goes guess what else? And he lifts his foot up and he had no shoes on. He goes, I also gave him the sho my shoes and my socks because he had none. And I was like, that's just his heart. He didn't even think twice about giving. And I said, what did your fiance say, William? She goes, she said, I'm crazy. Like, I mean, he gave him all of his money, his shoes and his socks. And, and, and he's okay now. He's the guy's okay. Oh, he is. Yeah. The guy's okay. You know, I wonder how deep that root of what yeah. like he said he watched the guy's throat get slit yeah. and then he didn't do anything because it wasn't his business and now it's like he's making people's pain part of his business like yes. he can't he then he could no, avoid it and no, he can't no, even no, avoid no, it now no, no, no. and when you're in there you're kind of not attached to, yeah, yeah. to yourself a little yeah. bit so you're yeah, just yeah. desensitized yeah. I mean again yeah. we talked about being in solitary yeah. confinement for eight years yeah. I mean really let's think and I know I keep saying this but I don't think people can understand really to be like if you are in your bathroom for eight years <laughs> I mean, no products. We're talking. <laughs> I can't you give don't myself get a manicure, no pedicure. You know how you have lots of samples to try. <laughs> and so I my hair. You're like, I should. Try. This mask was ten years old. I should try it. There's none of that. You're just there with yourself and your thoughts and your anger and your pain and your sadness and all of that stuff. And really, he consistently has shown the where his heart was you know and again i mean when when you think about a little boy i just picture him yeah, as a little yeah. child you know just the other day i was at disneyland and uh, not inside but i 
was staying around there. So I ran through there. And so I was kept thinking all the little kids going into Disneyland and I couldn't, and which I used to do every summer because I lived there. And so I, and I thought, wow, how many little kids are in Disneyland right now that are going to be in prison? They're, they're cute. They have their Mickey Mouse ears on and they're ready to just enjoy the day. And they end up in prison because of different reasons. Or so, even currently, what yeah, what abuse me, yeah. and neglect are they suffering? Yes. Even while they get to go to Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. What if what is going on in them that will take them to that place? Because probably it's already happening. Yeah. Yes. So I just yeah. um, I want to people do, to uh, know that, uh, like to take extra uh, minutes with people that have been in prison. Sure. So you can say, not like, so what did you do? Like, what happened to you? There's a book that's out by, mm-hmm. you know, it's, um, what happened to you and really oh, take a minute okay. to see because that's I mean what what William oops I'm leaving that's weird okay what what <laughs> What William is doing now is um, he's someone that's there for those people. Yeah. So he never got out. He would, other well, people would have not have had the opportunity to meet him and experience someone that had been in prison for all that time. And then now what they're doing. I think about what rich friendships um, we've made meeting people that have been through really, really hard things. Um, and it's, it's the people that have embraced and accepted their right, hard things and helps. accepted the t- choices they had made, but also yeah. giving themselves this grace and compassion for where they came from yeah. and the things that happened to them. Okay, okay. And even William talked okay, about okay. a lot about the shame, the cycle that just kind of always kind of finds its way back in and then he has to reconcile with it and move forward. And he stays soft, he stays compassionate, he stays being about other people, but he still has to wrestle with that yes. constantly. And I didn't go to prison but I have to wrestle with things every day. Yeah, and doesn't I have, everybody? Well, I, I, I would hope that we could all accept that and acknowledge mm-hmm. that and say, yeah. um, I do struggle with this thing and name it. We've talked a lot about that. Name the thing, name the emotions, name the shame that we that you have in your quiet time and your private time. And then when it comes oh, up, you can remember where it came from and why you're not going to make those decisions again. Yeah. Why you're going to love yourself so that you can love others better. And he's doing that. He's clearly loving himself well so he can love others. Yeah, you can't love others if it's not in you. And, no. and he's doing that well. Yeah, he is. Yeah, for sure. I think, I know it's probably really hard for him to have a son being in prison. And um, William is an emotional person. So um, I, it's, it's just, like you said, it is such a joy to be able to interact with people. And it's interesting because when I, I have to be honest, when I first saw that movie, Dead Man Walking, many years ago, I was the opposite. I was like, judgy, judgy, judgy because I was not attached to myself for lack of a better word. And so I I was never sharing my truth. So I would judge, judge, judge. And so it's really interesting for me to be on the other side now. It's completely different experience. That was fun. Sorry. Don't be apologetic. Sorry, guys. No, we just were talking about you. (laughs) We were just talking about you. (laughs) I didn't expect that. He was supposed to call yesterday. Oh, that's exciting. That's, How that's was awesome. it? <laughs> what you talk about? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just did you kidding. say I'm live on Facebook right now? <laughs> I did, and I told him that, uh, or he told me that he got my old job. So oh. he is the GED tutor now. Oh, How do you feel about that? Good. I mean, I taught him everything he knew. So that's he's awesome. Full circle. Cool. He's yeah. a GED tutor now. And wow. you, now you can have to talk about that because you know what it's like and what he's going through. And yeah. that's cool. Well, that we is. have run our hour here, but I don't I want to do our speed round. Can we, okay. Can you do it off the fly since you don't have your thing? Maybe. Yeah. So we do this fun thing to end our thing, our show. Like this can sometimes feel heavy and sometimes be really emotional, but we like to do something that's kind of fun and funny and <laughs> Find some lightness. Get to a drink. No, find I'm some lightness saying. to prison world. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Goodness. <laughs> it's not whiskey, is it? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't tell the audience that we give a little love at the cups. Yeah. No. no. 
Um, okay, do you want to Well, I was thinking one thing really quick because yes. I always want to go a little bit. <laughs> just, I wanted to just say one thing real quick is that William, you had the opportunity, I'm sorry, I'm not um, to by coincidence run into the person, a family member of your victim. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is that okay? I should I should ask before, but I think it's such a beautiful after reading the letter, and after <coughs> experiencing William's life right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, how has I don't know if you want to say anything about that, or, <coughs> because it's just I mean, just think about like what someone in prison would want to hear, or we have a lot of family members that listen to people that you know that have loved ones in prison and that for life sentences and they're grasping for mm -hmm. hope and so just those could be last words of that and then we'll do a quick little story well, around. I did run into the brother of the gentleman that was the victim in my crime. The first time I ran into him he was drunk he followed me in his truck. Ended up good because he left. So I'm going to condense it like yeah. quickly. Mm -hmm. But the second time I ran into him, I noticed that he was following me. So the third time I was pulling off of Columbus and I seen his truck. I pulled in, knocked on the door. He answered the door. And I basically, quickly, I said, I can't live like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he forgave me. But the mother came to the door. And you weren't expecting that. And I wasn't expecting that. It was um, very emotional. And I, you know, I asked her in Spanish, you know, perdóname, and she said, it's, it's, okay. it's okay, mijito. And they said, Dios te bendiga, which is God bless you. She gave me a hug. Mm. And from basically, the from the mother of the gentleman mm -hmm. that lost his life. And basically, the weight was lifted off of me. I, she took her. It was, it was heartfelt. And, uh, a miracle in itself mm -hmm. from being out of prison. That's a miracle. Because you weren't there. supposed to go anywhere near them. I wasn't. But you felt like I need to go apologize no matter what happens. Yes. Yeah. I did. There was the consequences weighed more than the outcome could have. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the way the outcome came, the consequences didn't even matter. So, Isn't that amazing? Yeah. How long ago was that? That was actually not too long ago. It was like about three months ago. Mm -hmm. So that's just saying that like if the mother, you know, had that within her to bless you and say, you know, go and, you know, live, live, live your life basically, you know, um, and, and to like, how can we do that? How, how can we pull that out of ourselves to do that for other people around us? Yeah. Hope is very mm -hmm. strong. Hopefully, yeah. Talk about that word before we move on. Hope. Yeah. We yeah. talked a little bit about it. Oh, and everybody who don't think that they'll ever see the light of day, if they ever do hear this, you have to keep hope alive, regardless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're doing 700 million years. Yeah. You have to keep hope in your heart because there may be that time that when all else fails and you think nothing's going to good or good is going to come about it, hope slaps you in the mm -hmm. face and you're walking out the door in seven days. And isn't that just life stuff too? I mean, that's huge in prison, but that's just like our life too. And we're like, our car broke down, this happened, I have no money, whatever it is, you're like, hope can slap you in the face, bam. And say, <laughs> well, here's another thing. Do you remember the incident with my daughter, mom, whatever, she yeah, took the $1,500? Yeah, yeah. 
there was two days where I was like, crap, how am I going to live? How am I going to get my rent? And I was like, well, who cares? <laughs> it's either going to happen or I'm going to get kicked out of where I live. And you not didn't even, stress about it. We even played a song. Yeah. That was kind of not even a day later, magically, somehow I ended up getting money for doing something. And somebody was like, hey, look, I like your smile. Here's a hundred bucks. I was like, no way. For real. You need to start walking around smiling. <laughs> I have smile all the time. Yeah. There is <laughs> not a, a well, awesome. there may be moments where I'm not smiling, but my heart is. Mm. I mean, I'm kind of like a Care Bear. You are. Kind of. You can give a name. You are a Care Bear. Hope Bear. Oh, there he is. That's Hope funny. Bear. Hope Bear. But remember, a bear is still a bear. Oh. <laughs> oh, That's shoot. Okay. I can respect some bear. Yeah. Bear's good. I like it. Yeah. yeah. It's been, been good. good. Yeah. This has been good. We appreciate you being here and no being problem. off the fly and taking yes. calls and coming in after work and, and reading all of what you read. That was very vulnerable and very brave and very just putting it all out there. And it said a lot. That's why I wanted you to read it versus just sharing your story because I think you put it all in that letter. So. Mm -hmm. Now everybody knows. And you're still yeah. free. And you're I am free. still free. And, you're yeah. still free. and there's a lot of people walking around with those kinds of stories that don't talk about it. I well, know personally people that are like withering away in shame that are not talking about it. And it's just only keeping them in their own private prison. Well, to help with that. Yes. People who are walking around with that type of story. They need to put it out there. Yeah. Because they could save somebody else. Yes. So Absolutely. it doesn't matter how much pain you're in, your pain may be able mm -hmm. to help and give one other person's hope. 100%. Yeah. So that means yes. get out of your damn self. It's not and I mean, about you. I'm, you I'm getting goosebumps and I'm out of my comfort zone. I didn't want it out there, but you know, it's, it's going to help. Yeah. Yes. If it doesn't help, I guarantee you one person is going to ask questions. Yeah, for sure. So. And we did get your permission prior to doing this that you were going to read that. No. <laughs> yes. You're still a bear. Come on. I asked you that. Yes. Okay, okay, let's do a couple. Speed 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 okay, so you're just going to answer this Short, in like quick. one sent one word or two. Okay. Okay. So on a scale from one to 10, how cool are you? 10. Oh, yeah. Love that answer all the time. Who do you admire the most? Like in myself. Like Christy or me. Yourself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just... Hey, do you know what? After what you've been through, um, I say go yeah, for that. Yeah. Honestly, the, the person I admire the most, even though she's passed away, is my mother. Mm. Even though that all the stuff that she's put me through and everything that we've gone through, she's still my mother. She's your mama. And I love her to this, you know, to this day. She's your mama bear. That's awesome. That's a huge, so many things there. We could be here for days. Um, what was yes. your favorite prison food or prison recipe? Uh, Chinese food. You had Chinese food in prison? Well, we made it. I never made that. Wow. That would be, was it good? It's will you make good. that for us one time? I will. <laughs> I'm just I will. So, and it has hot Cheetos. Oh yeah, for sure. Did it have chicharrones or is that just it did that was the pork rinds was in it? Yeah. It was it was mixed oh, up. Chicharrones, yeah, I remember those levels. Yeah. Like, well, what was your favorite thing in the commissary? Is that the same kind of question? No, it was different. Shoes. Of course. What was the thing you couldn't live without? Like if they were out of this item in commissary, you were gonna freak out. Hot Cheetos. Hot Cheetos. First Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, are you a morning or night person? I'm an all day person. Mm, all day person. What's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? That I'm free. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, if you won the lottery, what would 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 you buy me a house? No, I'm just kidding. If What's the first the thing you would you would do with the money? Say you won like ten million dollars. I would donate a lot of it. Yeah. I would donate a lot of because there's more people that need help than just me needing a new car, me needing a boat, me needing a new house. 
when when you've done so much time in prison or even a little bit of time in prison you start to realize that things are like no not important at all right material what is it called? materialistic yeah yeah it means nothing right yeah. it's so, so bizarre if this will be our last one yeah sound good mm -hmm. if there were no barriers like um, money time location transportation there's no barriers in your world what would your ideal job or way you would spend your day be mm. working for the recovery cafe did you hear that what? stephanie you hear that? stephanie recovery did you cafe. Hear that? well that'll happen for sure, I'm sure. and uh, that's awesome money and that all that materialistic stuff you know doesn't pertain to me because i showed you yes I, I shared that story while you were on the phone what? i gave how you all the money up in the I gave all my money that was in my wallet to a guy and brand new tennis shoes. You, oh, you gave me a brand new tennis shoe? And, and the socks. Barefoot in the car. And the socks. So how does that, I just had to ask real quick. So how does that compare to the guy that was at the cafeteria in Chow watching the guy's throat get cut? How is that different? How were you, like what made those, was it being the big contrast? Well, the, the, the biggest thing is, is even though that I was eating, I knew that it was not my place to do anything, mm -hmm. but I know inside I was just screaming, help him, help him, mm -hmm. help him. Uh -huh. And now look at you. Help me. That's what you're doing. That's all you're doing. You're helping. I'm trying. You are. We well, you're trying. You're doing it. I'm trying because there's times, it's like when, the other day with Brandon, that I, I kind of broke my heart, I, even though I just grabbed the guy and was like, hey, man. You need to go to detox. You were hugging let's, him. Let's go. You were just hugging him. Yeah. yeah. You're doing it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, you know, we always want to do an ask. So if anybody is watching or listening and is part of an organization that helps youth, that has an opportunity for speakers or someone that's been through it to, um, to pour into um, kids and youth and people that that maybe would listen to somebody that had done a lot of time and who was into gangs. And, you know, we have a lot of people around here that were in gangs and that are now really pouring into the people to bring them out of the gangs, which mm -hmm. is so, which is so beautiful because they're the ones with the lived experience. So thank you, William. You're mm -hmm. always a joy. Thank and it's you. just, I mean, when you think if someone says, oh, wow, a guy with 18 years in prison, it makes you first be like, what? And then, so it's just, you know, I just ask people to really take a moment to um, check yourself and what your judgment is, which is, you know, it's fair for people to be curious, like, should, you know, am I safe? And, you know, all the different things that come, uh, come along with someone in prison. It really mm -hmm. does. I mean, we just were the safest person you could be with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, I hope so. After 72 <laughs> anger management classes, my <laughs> Lord, 73, <laughs> 73. <laughs> Okay, you guys, All thank right. you so much. Are we done, Allison? Yes, okay. I'm so glad I know William now. I told you. So glad. So good. You did tell me. Yeah. You I were right. You. Yeah. What's new? Did you hear that? <laughs> All right, have a good Wednesday and a good weekend, and we will be back when, Christy? We'll be back with Kimberly Haven on the 25th. She's an amazing person um, involved in so much since coming out of prison, and um, so that's on the 25th. Sunday? Yep, Sunday okay. night. Okay, happy Wednesday. Bye, guys. We get to push the buttons. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. What do we do right here? Mm -hmm. Bye.